Uh, Chris, I've, I've been reading um, today's Monday, the 20th, April the 20th. And so you and I were talking last week um, about um, the guy who's head of HUD thinking there, would, there wouldn't be a million forbearance agreements. And we talked about how crazy that was because you were talking about it'd be three or four times that amount. And it seems like on Friday, within a week of when he made that prediction, it was already over three million, million forbearances. <laughs> so, I mean, you hit that right on the money. I mean, uh, you know, so you, so effectively, Chris, you're smarter than the guy that runs. Uh, uh, well, I think that collaborator, you know, he's, he's rough on a lot of feathers. He didn't think this would be a big, uh, uh, a rush to forbearance, you know, like they thought, but if anytime somebody can give you three months of free mortgage payments and you don't have to prove a hardship, which is the, the biggest boneheaded move they made, is people that are still actively working, um, you know, are still taking the forbearance because there's nothing to prove. You don't have to prove any hardship at all. You just let your servicer know that you want to enter into a forbearance. And what we're trying to make people understand is forbearance doesn't mean forgiveness. So what we're hoping the legislatures will do on all these servicers um, is create some legislation where they add these deferred payments to the back of the loan that they don't come due month four you know, after the three months is over, you've missed 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, which that starts the eviction or foreclosure process on, um, in our world. So then month four comes and now you got four payments due. And if you did have a hardship and you've been out of work for a couple of months, 78% of America lives paycheck to paycheck. They're not going to have the funds to pay four payments at one time. So something is going to have to be done on the back end. So to rectify what's going to be a bigger avalanche of problems starting this fall. Well, uh, <clears throat> the article I was reading, uh, the majority of the people who are asking for the forbearance agreements are the people who have uh, FHA mortgages. And uh, they're people who have had those mortgages recently, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, these are the really the, the borrowers who have decided to participate in the American dream of owning a house. Sure. They've, saved, they've saved some money up. They've paid, you know, 4%, 5% down. They've owned the house for two or three years. They don't have any equity in the home. And now uh, they're unemployed. Or they, they're not unemployed yet, but they're worried about being unemployed. And they've asked for this forbearance agreement. Mm -hmm. What happens to their credit? Does the forbearance agreement count against their credit? It does. We've already seen reports where people have entered into a forbearance or they've called their servicer and asked information about the forbearance. So we've seen people's credit reports come up that says this loan is in forbearance. Most of the time on refinance or purchases in the last 12 months, you have to have a 12 month pay history um, to be eligible for a new loan. So we don't know what's going to happen. This is going to be the unintended consequence that we talk about all the time with all these rules and stuff that they throw out. And, and let's be honest, nobody saw this coming and they had to act quick. But the unintended consequences is it's going to destroy people's credits. It's going to create a bunch of short sales and foreclosures. I think in the fourth quarter, starting into the fourth quarter of this year when the bill comes due, unless some legislation passes where they don't let these report um, as – you know, because if their loan is coded in forbearance, it could create the opportunity that we think rates are going to go even lower over the summer. People are not going to be eligible to refinance. And I know, you know, I had this conversation. Uh, I can't remember if I've done so many Zoom meetings, but I had this conversation, you know, but a lot of these people are so short-sighted. They don't care what six months looks like for them. They want to survive this month and next month. So if there's implications on their credit, um, I think some, you know, in some cases that's the least of their worries and that's the people that have been impacted and have not been able to work. But I think the bigger problem is, is where you didn't have to show um, <clears throat> any hardship to qualify. And that's where we've seen 3 million plus people require or uh, request forbearance and have entered into forbearance agreements with their servicers. So Chris, what, um, so let's think through for a second. Uh, I'm still seeing posts and I, I think I'm going to appoint myself a sheriff of YouTube because there are some people on YouTube that honestly just amazing how bad the information, how I view 
the information to be just bad. Right. Uh, the the investor market uh, is completely ha has completely fallen apart. I mean, that was the first thing to go. So we had, so uh, in real money and real conversation, uh, I had about seven hundred fifty thousand loans, upon which I had paid um, uh, appraisal fees, mm -hmm. upon which we never got appraisals and they never got out of underwriting. So those are loans which the property's rented, it's been in good shape. I'm wanting to refinance on better terms. Uh, so if I've got, if, if I'm a small player in Knoxville and I've got uh, that volume, there must be hundreds of millions of dollars of investor loans that did not get done. That oh. investors are counting on getting done. I mean, I had a couple million myself in the pipeline that just we couldn't fulfill. There was no outlet for them. We had one loan that was clear to close on Tuesday. It was going to close Friday. They wouldn't fund it on Friday. This was a loan that was out of underwriting, ready to close, but because there's no end buyer, there's no none of these hedge funds because the servicing values of these loans are shit right now. They're worth nothing. Right. So if these investors fund these loans, they set on their warehouse lines, and if they can't turn over their warehouse lines to make new loans and free up capital, they're out of business. And because there's nobody buying mortgage-backed securities other than the federal government, they're buying, you know, securitized loans. But the, the ones that the non-QM and the lending that we're talking about is bought by hedge funds. And if nobody's buying them because they're not worth anything, um, that's created the problem. When then all this started, the non-QM lending was the first. We saw the big lenders. Um, and I don't really want to say names, but there's bigger players in the market. And we just started seeing them fall, one after another, announcing we're, out of the business, out of business, out of business. And now it's got down to, to where there's some really big players in that market that are well capitalized that said, we can't afford the risk. Um, we've had one lender, which I will mention Sprout came back out and they rolled out three products, but they're not the same products that they were offering before. They were really watered down products to say that there is a little bit of an appetite, but as a whole, the debt service coverage loans, the non-QM loans have all just I mentioned the other night, it's like from Tiger King, they put sardine oil on them and they just disappeared. I mean, <laughs> they literally vanished and they were the first to go. And the next thing we're seeing is the FHA lending is the next thing that's getting the squeeze. But back to investor loans, if investors can't buy these houses, um, <clears throat> cause it's big business. I mean, it's a billion dollar business across the country. And if these investors can't buy these loans, because that's why I've been a true advocate for investors cause you guys, are the ones that keep these communities. You put families in these households, you take a, a non-performing asset and turn it into a home and put a family in it. Now it's part of the community. It raises people with property values. You guys make money in turn, but you're taking a dilapidated property, paying back taxes on it, <clears throat> getting it up to snuff, getting it sold, getting it back to a performing asset. I mean, that's what you guys are the backbones of the communities to keep, keep uh, the values growing in a lot of these places. Well, <clears throat> Chris, the, the investors in Knoxville, we know for a fact, have been about 20% of all sales every single month yeah. for almost seven years now. Right. The, uh, and that, I think on a national level, it's probably in that 18 to 22% range in every market in the country. Okay. The issue gets to be if the investors aren't buying now, and I think there's still investors who are looking to buy, um, at some price in the marketplace. But the whole thing about market value is people are still talking about buying below. I was listening to some guy today and he was talking about, uh, you got to know what the, you're buying below market value. Well, how do you know what the, this is catch a falling knife time. Uh, how do you know what the market value is if the investors are not buying and that's holding up about, let's say 20% of the market. So let's say, 15% of the buyers of the investor market's gone. There's still, let's say 5% out there buying. Um, and you look at the, what it's taking to qualify for FHA mortgages. Now, didn't they raise the credit limit on FHA mortgages? FHA hasn't raised the credit limit. They still do down to a 500 credit score, but all these lenders have overlays that they've had to add because of their risk appetites different from lender to lender. What we've seen most common. Explain, is, that. Explain that, Chris. What's that? What do you mean by overlay? 
overlays is just that certain lenders risk appetite to write loans where if they were doing down to a 580 credit score with three and a half percent down because that's what you could do on fha traditionally and right. then if you, they would do down to 500 score if they had 10 percent down but trust me nobody had a 500 score and 10 percent to put down or they wouldn't have a 500 credit score so that's irrelevant but most lenders have raised up to a 620 640 680 top minimum score and where you could go 55 percent debt to income ratios on your overall debt have now lowered that to 40 percent so you're going to make that do what who's going to make that in that fha uh, buyer category yeah it's not it's really not fha it's just kind of a um you know it's really a, convent, a subprime conventional loan to some oh. sort but so the fha thda hud loan category was really USDA, USDA, FHA, VA are all on the same Jenny May servicing pool and they've all been impacted. So VA, I'm an advocate for VA loans and our veterans. They've, they've been chunked into that category with FHA with some of the scratch and dent stuff, but to be, you know, FHA for VA actually performs better in the marketplace than conventional loans. But unfortunately it's backed by Jenny May. So it's in that category, but even those um, guidelines have tightened up. You used to be able to do 100% cash out refis on VA loans. Now, if you're doing cash out, you can only do 90%. So those have been impacted as well. So that's another 15 or 20% of the marketplace. So uh, let's- This is a big one, Elizabeth. Don't do it on camera, Victor. It's too old to get that. You have to understand, Sam. You have to get right. you old that joke. So, yeah, not everybody would get that reference. Uh, uh, Lamont, yeah, that's another big percentage of the marketplace is the FHA buyers. So um, 20, 20%, let's say that group wow. is 20%. Okay. Let's say that we're still getting the very upper end of that group done, but there's 30% of the buying market that just doesn't exist. Right. And the investor buyer is the one that is buying the houses to fix them up to get them, as we would say, buyer ready. And so a lot of the people who are buying um, in the F, in that Ginny May pool, the FHA people with a small amount of money down, they just do not have the money to go in and repair a house. Right. They don't have the capital to fix it. Right. And so if there's not a buyer out there to buy the properties to fix them up, how much longer will the marketing time increase for the homes that are sellable. Somebody's living in them today. Those people want to buy a new home, but you can't find the buyer who's ready to buy at the price. And this, I'm talking, I'm, I just see things breaking out differently, Chris, in the simplest right. in the sense that um, the price that people will pay for a home, market value, is the way it works in the real world is demand plus the availability of finance. Right. And uh, after the 2008 crash, what we saw was there was no financing available. There might be demand, but there was no financing available. And the people who did have cash, you couldn't get them motivated to buy until they believed that it was the best buy in a thousand years. So now we've got a situation where there's, going to be limited demand, but the financing is getting to be so difficult that now we're in a combination of there's not much demand because who wants to buy and move in today's climate when you don't know what the condition, you know, whether you're going to be employed, whether you're going to have a job, whether your friends are going to have a job and why would you want to pack up and put every have movers handle all of your stuff, put it in a truck and move it somewhere else. So I, I see the market, the investor not buying to fix up the houses and the lack of turnover from the Ginny May pool of buyers is going to create a situation with these deferments that have been granted that, that May, June, July, I think that August, September, October timeframe is going to be unbelievably brutal. It is. Our landscape will be forever changed. Am, am I missing? Am I, am I being too negative? Am I being too negative? No, I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on because we can see, I think we see what's coming. I mean, we're not short-sighted to, to, you know, think this is a great situation we're in where people are getting free mortgage payments. 
there's legislation now, I guess you've seen that, where they want to give every U.S. Home, US person $2,000 a month until this is over mm-hmm. or something like that and suspend all mortgage and rent payments for everybody. Uh, that, that, that'll be dead on arrival. That'll never pass, but that's kind of what they're talking about now. Well, I don't, you know, it's... But the, the thousand a month, twelve hundred dollars a month. People that are getting that. There's, there's all kinds of posts that people are putting up and uh, anecdotal information that people are spending the, their twelve hundred dollars on all of these frivolous and miscellaneous things, TVs and oh, all yeah. kinds. Of things. But I, I don't. Me personally, you know, we're we're not going to be evicting anybody that has made an effort to be a good tenant over time. They've made the effort to pay the rent, and we're. I, I'm a. You know, I'm a big boy about this stuff, and I recognize that somebody who is working uh, and trying to make things happen mm-hmm. and unemployed because of no fault of their own. Right. If if they get a check coming in, they're going to buy groceries. They're going to pay their cell phone bill for sure. Right. They're pay their utility bill for sure. If they need medicine, they're going to buy the medicine. Right. But they're not going to pay rent. I mean, I think in I think in April, uh, you and I were talking back in March. Uh, I said uh, if we got seventy percent of the rent collected uh, in April, we'd be really satisfied. I think uh, Kelvin told me we got something like seventy-five percent of the rent collected, but we're looking for May to be really tough. Yeah, really it's tough. Going to catch up with people, yeah, because now you're starting to see the impact, and we're seeing a lot of people post on Facebook, and those people are most of the time very boastful. Still closing, still getting offers, multiple offers. We're closing quick. But you and I both know we've been around a long time, maybe me longer than you. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> <laughs> we know things closing today technically started 60, 90 days ago, right? I mean, exactly. by the time they decided to buy, get approved, go find a house, put in two or three offers, and get to closing, we know that's typically a 60 to 90 day process from the time you decide, hey, I want to go buy a house. Sometimes it happens qu- quick. Sometimes you've got something to sell that slows down things, but you know, these closings today didn't happen during this pandemic. It didn't happen. No. So we're going to see those numbers starting in May. So I think I saw for the month of March, we had less sales over the month, month of March year over year than we did in 2019. Those number of transactions were down and that was before the coronavirus uh, happened. So starting in May, I think we're start going forward. We'll start seeing those real numbers. So, Chris, uh, I've said that my goal is to be standing on July the 1st. And we're, we've got projects that we've got that we're working on, uh, remodels that are already in the pipeline uh, and funded for the pipeline. But And we're seeing demand for rental property. There's no question about it. Uh, the problem gets to be, uh, for everybody right now, is uh, we're – we don't use a credit scoring. I mean, we, we will rent to people who are making an effort to change their lives. Sure. So we don't use a standard credit scoring system like so many people do. But right now, if you're unemployed and you're trying to rent a property, it's in today's world, it's almost impossible to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't do that. You can't get any type of financing if you're unemployed. And that's, that's the other thing I wanted to hit on is even on the conventional loans, you know, we, we are very, you know, we used to verify employment within 10 days of closing. 10 days was very normal. Verify. This is not talking about we're verifying what they make and we're collecting pay stubs. All we're doing at this point is calling to verify, hey, is Joe still working at ABC company? Yes, he's still employed. Nothing has changed. And, it, and most of the time, the borrowers didn't even know that happened. It's a call to HR supervisor. But now, now that's changed to where we're doing it the day before closing. Yeah. Verifying they're still working. And before we send the wire on the day of closing, verifying employment a second time within 24 hours, because if that loan doesn't make their first payment, it's an EPO, it's an early payment default. And now that loan can't be securitized by Fannie or Freddie. Now it's an unsellable loan and gets stuck on the warehouse line. So not only have we seen the non-QM FHA tighten up, it's also had an impact on the higher quality conventional buyers and that's due to the unemployment numbers and people being let go or being uh, furloughed and they don't see it coming. Well, um, one of the, the jumbo loan market, the big <laughs> house, <clears throat> the big market, if um, 
all these uh, doctors are all struggling. I mean, uh, the yeah, front all line the elective are, surgeries and things oh, are just yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, I have. Since I know several general surgeons and mm -hmm. uh, orthopedic surgeons, uh, you know, it's the you know I had an orthopedic surgeon one tell me once that uh, uh, he's just a body mechanic and he recognizes his job is to um, ha have you come in, think that you're not running all cylinders, he's making an effort to make you run on all cylinders. But he said those guys who put their hands on your heart, uh, they think they're the hands of God. Right. And the guys who work on your brain. Uh, go, those neuro, those neurosurgeons, mm -hmm. they they think they are God, right? <laughs> so it's, but the reality is, they're all going broke. The general public does not understand that these surgeons have got these big practices, of which their largest single bill is malpractice insurance. They've got this trained staff that has done nothing but work to be sure that their infection rate is really low when they have these surgeries. Mm -hmm. And the surgery center mortgage goes on. The, the, equipment, the equipment in the surgery center. The payments go on, right? Uh, yep. the malpractice insurance, you can't let malpractice insurance lapse. I mean, you talk about something you can't get back. Right. It gets to be really difficult. And these surgeries, these surgeons, big players in the jumbo real estate market, uh, they're all struggling right now trying to get back to elective procedures. Uh, I mean, you're seeing bariatric surgery, you know, people want to put on li lipo bands to lose a little weight. Right. You know, they're trying to figure out how to have that be as uh, emergency surgery, essential surgery, rather than an elective surgery. Instead of an elective, right? Is that what right. it is? Preventative surgery? Preventive. And so, yeah. uh, but as we look at the overall investing market and the speed with which things are going to turn, I just see it coming to a halt in September and October. Yeah, there was another thing that we I wanted to go into was banks have now stopped doing equity loans. A lot of investors, if they weren't doing non-QM loans or lines of credit, or they had lines of credit at the bank, or they had equity loans. Banks are no longer doing equity loans. Those have stopped. Most of the bankers are working on PPP loans and SBA loans that obviously didn't earmark enough money, right. but they've got all hands on deck trying to process those applications. Uh, for these small businesses. Uh, the guy that I refer all my equity lines to he said, we've stopped everything in the bank. Everybody's working on small business loans and PPP loans. Um, and So HELOC you know, loans are gone. Uh, do what? The HELOC loan is just basically dried up? Dried up. Jumbo loans, non-QM loans, FHA is tightening. Conventional landscape has changed with the verification of employments. Uh, minimum credit store scores going up. Months of reserves required have gone up. Debt to income ratio maximums have gone down. It looks entirely different than it did 30 days ago. So Chris, last question. Um, and I'm hoping to get this posted up before we can use it on Facebook. Okay. Uh, the, how does it work when loans don't, they default in the first five or six months of the loan? What happens to the loan? Well, on our end, we have to do buyback. So if the if the borrower hasn't made six payments or 180 days haven't lapsed, right? Uh, the you know the mortgage broker we got to buy that loan back. So we got to you know be insure. So that's why it's so scary now to make a loan. If we're making a loan now at say four percent, and rates drop to say two and a half percent, this is all hypothetical numbers. We don't know. But if rates drop in the next two months and we start getting hit with early payoff options on these loans, it's going to kill the small guys. Not just the big guys, right? Those big guys, you know, there was no service and release premium being made on that. So after that six payments made, that loan is then a mortgage-backed security. But until then, it's on the warehouse line. It's not securitized. But after that, <clears throat> it could it could have a tremendous blowback on the small guys, too. And it's people taking advantage of lower rates, which we can't um, can't blame them for wanting to take advantage of. But well, it's a, it's a certain rates are going to stay going to be they're going, going to, to be stay low. low and go down. It's a certain. I mean, there's no question that the the government will force the rates down to try to get people to buy. Housing is the one thing that stimulates the economy. It's the biggest driver of the economy overall is the housing market. So well, I'm going to do a video on how that came to be, why that came to be. Okay. 
than the part that the National Association of Realtors had in creating the slogan, uh, everybody should buy the American dream, a home right. for everyone, right? Okay. Um, but Chris, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, brainstorm on this. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely uh, the best mortgage broker that I know. I appreciate so, that. Well, we've done business for a long time now. Well, so yeah. love, uh, you, and we have. I'll be. I'll be happy I, to get I wish, I, wish, I wish you'd been doing it longer than me, but I'm getting yeah. old. So there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Not close, but I'm, I'll be happy to get on the other side of this thing. That's for sure. To get back to what somewhat normal lending life, normal activity, normal family life. I miss being able to go out to eat. Some. This is you know for I've talked to others. They said this brought their family closer together. Some. You know, <laughs> disruptions because you're stuck and you know, in the house, but you know, a lot of people have enjoyed the family time. So hopefully we don't come out of this the same. Hopefully we come out better than before. Um, you know, that's, that's the, there's, there's opportunity in every situation. And, and hopefully when we come out of the other side, we're better than when, when this thing started. So that's the goal. And I can't wait to get on the other side of this thing. Chris, um, July the 1st, that's, uh, that's what we're shooting for. July Hopefully we're celebrating our freedom on 4th of July, right? Sounds like a plan. <laughs> well, Chris, thank, you, thank you very much.